way back in the early 1970s. Cellular biologists turned muscle cells into fat cells. I know what some of you are thinking. Why couldn't they have turned fat cells <laughs> into muscle cells? <laughs> Had that thought myself a few times. But they didn't. Before that, it was a scientific certainty that myoblasts, myo means muscle, myoblasts would always become muscle, something that looks like this. That's what a myoblast becomes. It's genetically programmed to become that. But in this study, they didn't get that result. Here's how the study worked. Cellular biologist took a myoblast, basically a stem cell that turns into muscle, and created thousands of daughter cells from that single mother cell, genetically identical to each other, genetically identical to the mother and put them into three different cultures, or call them environments. In the one environment, they appropriately manifest as muscle tissue. In the second environment, though, bone tissue. Huge surprise. In the third environment, fat cells. Muscle turned into fat, and that's really gross, so let's go back to the muscle. <laughs> this was not part of the plan. The plan was, the hypothesis was, the myoblasts will turn into muscle or they will die in an inappropriate environment. And yet, what happened was, the environment governed the expression of the myoblast, of the DNA, of the gene. This created a new scientific understanding of biology. It actually changed our fundamental understanding of biology. And to this day, people declare this blasphemous, saying DNA is primary, not the environment. And this is known as genetic determinism, and you'll recognize these people by the nice, shiny suits that they wear. And this says, and then one day some wise men realized that the environment didn't matter anymore, so long as we wear these nice, shiny suits. Well, why does all of this matter? This all matters to us here today because we've now realized that not only do cells express pursuant to the environmental forces, but communities of cells do too, and that would be people. We are communities of cells. And communities of people also express pursuant to the environment. What happened in our thinking was we went to one of my mentors early on in developing this thinking, and he was a skeptical man. He said, Rich, perhaps microscopic cells manifest pursuant to the environment. But people don't. People have imagination. People have free will. People govern the environment. And that got me to thinking about one of my friends in high school. His name was Dave Strong. And he grew up in this part of East Cleveland. He was born there in 1969 and grew up in a very distressed East Cleveland surrounded by gunshots and violence, surrounded by crack dens and street gangs. And happily for Dave, he was a gifted basketball player. And because of that, he was recruited to a private all-boys school in Hunting Valley called University School, or U.S. Now, when Dave went to U.S., he was growing up in a tough city, and he was in a tough situation, even in a tough city. They were on welfare. Dave didn't even have a bed to sleep in. He slept on a mat on the floor. And he went from that environment to this environment. It's only 10 miles from where Dave grew up to university school in Hunting Valley. That's about the most significant 10 miles in the world. Compared to East Cleveland, Hunting Valley is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily healthy environment. Well, here's what happened. In 1983, Dave and I were both in ninth grade at university school. Early on, we became friends, and he came to me, and he said, will you help me with this math problem? Of course, I started working through the problem with him. It was geometry and realized early on that he wasn't even getting to the geometry. He was struggling with long division, something they should have taught him in third grade. I showed him how to do long division. He learned it in a heartbeat. That was 1983. Fast forward to 1986. Dave had become the best basketball player at U.S. by far. 
and that was not all that surprising. I think when they were in eighth grade, I think when he played for Kirk in eighth grade, they beat us like 110 to 30. But what was surprising was Dave had also become one of our most gifted calculus students. And not long after that, Dave went to a university called Johns Hopkins, and then to med school. And now he's a thriving ER doctor in Florida. It's amazing. But what was the difference between Dave in 1983 and Dave in 1986 and 87 when we were seniors? He was the same person. He had the same DNA. You can't change that. But he was a fundamentally different person. He was the expression of a healthy, nurturing environment. It turns out that no one is really innately smart, although smart people think they are. And no one is really innately unintelligent, although smart people think there are. <laughs> Scientists estimate that only about 2% of us have truly defective genes. That means 98% of us are born basically the same, basically the same potential. So, What's really amazing about all this to me is there's a single environmental factor that seems to govern all of this in urbanized areas. A single factor. Trees. Yes, trees. Even for me, it's hard to believe sometimes. But we've looked at cities and urbanized areas all over the world, from thriving Vienna, Austria, to struggling Manchester, England from prosperous Seattle, Washington, to distressed Cleveland, Ohio, the common denominator of success happens to be a healthy tree canopy, and the common denominator of distress happens to be the lack of trees. It's remarkably consistent all over the world. We had an early insight into this, a 2013 study that was published in the Washington Post, studied the greater Washington, D.C. area, and surprisingly concluded that tree canopy density indicated, solely indicated, the wealth of neighborhoods. A study the next year was done in Seattle, Washington. Not only did they confirm the DC results, wealth and prosperity completely related to tree canopy, but trees also uplifted people's moods measurably, uplifted human health measurably, and all the lower income neighborhoods had fewer trees. A fascinating study published in the journal of preventative medicine. Scientists were able to look at what happens to people when a tree canopy is wiped out overnight. The emerald ash borer tree disease wiped out the entire tree canopy in several cities in the United States overnight. Within a year or two, cardiovascular and respiratory disease increased human mortality, that means death, by 10%, an extra 21,000 deaths due to the loss of the tree canopy. A recent study published at by Temple University concluded, and I quote, contrary to long-held beliefs, contrary to long-held beliefs, urban crime is severely reduced when there are trees, abundant vegetation. And this brings me to a place with lots of trees. Vienna, Austria. Vienna is probably the most enduring and prosperous city in the history of Western civilization. And it has a 50% tree canopy. And it pretty much always has had a 50 plus percent tree canopy. Of course, before people were there, it had nearly 100%. But <laughs> when people got there, it got down to about 50. Vienna, seven consecutive years, ranked number one in the world in the quality of living index kept by the Mercer Consulting Group, the gold standard of such rankings. Vienna ranked number one in the world in prosperity by the United Nations Human Settlements Program. And that brings me back home to Cleveland, where we have less than a 20% tree canopy citywide in Cleveland, and we suffer the consequences. And yet, I have so much hope for our city, and I'll tell you why. This is a study of all 59 municipalities in Cuyahoga County, which is another problem we'll talk about later. But there are 59 municipalities in Cuyahoga County. You can see at the top are the most treed communities, and at the bottom are the least treed communities. You go from about 10 or 20% at the bottom to 70% at the top. 
Top five, Chagrin Falls, Bentleyville, Moreland Hills, Gates Mills. Anyone want to guess the fifth? Hunting Valley. Bottom five, Lindale, Warrensville Heights, North Randall, Brook Park. Anyone want to guess the next one? Cleveland, not East Cleveland, Cleveland. East Cleveland has too much parkland in it. So we have this massive disconnect between the treed cities and the untreed cities, and the wealthy ones benefit and the poor ones suffer. You can map virtually anything in Cuyahoga County by tree canopy. This is a tree canopy map of the county. The light area is where there are basically too few trees, and the green area is where there are enough trees. Here's a map of child poverty in Cuyahoga County. The dark blue areas where the extreme poverty occurs. You juxtapose them, all of the extreme poverty occurs in the absence of trees. Here's a heat map of lead poisoning in children in Cuyahoga County. The reds, the oranges, and the yellows are where there are a lot, lot of lead poisoning. Juxtapose it with the tree canopy map, and you have the exact same area highlighted. Here's a fascinating image from Google Earth, basically satellite photo. You can see where it goes from, in the highlighted area, from green to gray is actually the Shaker Heights Cleveland municipal line. You could map that municipal line precisely, even from a satellite photo, just from green to gray. When you combine these factors, the primacy of the environment, the way it governs our health and our distress, with the fact that trees tend to be the number one environmental factor in urbanized areas, and then you apply those lessons to Cleveland, it can be depressing. And yet I have so much hope for our region because we now have a simple and elegant answer. We can reforest our city. We can improve it vastly by designing and creating a new kind of city based on a foundational law of biology. Martin Luther King dreamed of that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands in freedom and equality. And, and in fact, this is the dream of the founding of our own nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men, meaning people, all people are created equal. And yet, if some people are living in environmental distress, and others are not, they can't be equal. Without relative environmental equality, there can never be human equality. So our dream is that children like this child will grow up safer and happier and healthier in the presence of parks and preserves, so that children like these children will grow up with beautiful trees nurturing them in a healthy environment. I grew up here, and I love this place. I've lived here basically my whole life. And it's where I've chosen to rear my own children. One of my children is in this photo, hugging a tree. And I've been so fortunate to work for an organization for the last 20 years that's preserved 50,000 acres of precious land and water resources in our region. And I've learned so much about our region, about why it is like it is, and about what it used to be, and about what it could be. And one of the things I've learned is our region focuses too often on effects and ignores the causes. The environment is the cause. Just like those cells you learned about earlier, you and I are shaped by where we live. And we owe it to ourselves, and we owe it to our children, to address the cause and not the effect. If we don't address the cause, the effects will never go away. And I promise you, these men in these shiny suits are not going to save us. And if we don't save ourselves, who will? We have to reforest our city together. If we don't do it, it's not going to happen. It will keep getting worse. You know, on your way here, maybe some of you drove by or noticed trees or a tree. What did you think? Did you think, that's a, that's a nice thing to have? That's a pretty place to sit in the shade? Or did you think, 
Those are essential to human health. Those are essential to human equality. Perhaps now, will you value trees differently? Will you view trees differently? Did we make you look? Thank you.